نحمده سبحانه ونستعينه ونستغفره ونستهديه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهدي الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن سيدنا ومولانا وعظيمنا وزعيمنا وحبيبنا محمدا صلى الله عليه وسلم قد بلغ الرسالة وأدى الأمانة ونصح الأمة وكشف الغمة وجاهد في سبيل دينه حتى أتاه اليقين فاللهم اجزه عنا وعن والدينا وعن الإسلام والمسلمين خير ما جازيت به نبيا عن قومه ورسولا عن أمته اللهم أحينا على سنته وآمتنا على ملته واحشرنا تحت لوائه وأوردنا حوضه واسقنا من يده الشريفة شربة هنيئة لا نظمأ بعدها أبدا اللهم آمين We are following on the topic of how to exercise and practice good manners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and today last time we focused on samples of prophetic manners how the prophets related to Allah to show ourselves the examples we need to follow how Ibrahim submitted to Allah how Moses and Aaron responded to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala how Nuh was very very respectful and appreciative of Allah glorifying him and accepting his decree even though it was his son's life and fate on the line but he accepted it and how all of these examples including Prophet Muhammad وسلم, exercised great caution when they spoke to Allah, when they prayed to Allah, when they asked Allah and when they even worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Today we are going to focus on the system, if you will, of rights and duties that govern our relationship with Allah. How is the relationship is set to be between Allah and his creation, especially us, the humans. The Prophet وسلم, was on a ride and behind him was Mu'adh ibn Jabal. So he called on Mu'adh. He said, Ya Mu'adh, Atadri ma haqqullahi ala al-ibad. O Mu'adh, do you know what the rights or what the right of Allah is on people? And Mu'adh, in humility and uh, respect, deferred and said, Allah wa Rasuluhu a'lam. Allah and his messenger know best. So the Prophet ﷺ went silent for some time. And then he called him again. Oh Mu'adh, do you know what the right of Allah is on his servants? He repeated the same answer. Allah and his messenger know best. In the third time he told him, Ya Mu'adh, O Mu'adh, the right of Allah on his servants is to worship him and associate no one with him. To worship Allah and ya'buduhu wa la yushriku bihi shay'an. And then he went silent for some time. Then he called him again. O oh Mu'adh, do you know what the rights of people are if they do that? Atadri ma haqqun nasi ala Allah? He said, Allah wa Rasulu A'lam. Allah and His Messenger know best. So he went silent. And will tell you why silence is good. He went silent. And then he called him again. Asked him again. He said, Allah wa Rasulu A'lam. So in the third time he told him, Ya Mu'adh, inna haqqa al-nasi haqqa al-ibadi ala Allah إذا هم عبدوه ولم يشركوا به شيئا ألا يعذبهم that he will not put them to torment in another narration أن يدخلهم الجنة that he would enter them into paradise so the relationship between people and their creator is based on the fact that Allah is the creator and we are his creation. He is the maker 
He is the one to command, guide, and order, and we are always to be ready to submit, to obey, and to follow. This is the relationship. The nature of the relationship is we are his servants, which means we are only here to serve his cause. We are not here to make money. We are not here to make children. We are not here to make positions or wealth or property or to leave this for that much. Nothing of that. All of this is subject to you earning your living and Allah provides. You work, He provides. That's all. But what the purpose for which He created us is to worship Him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I have not created the jinns or the humans except for one purpose, to worship me. So now, we accepted, we Muslims, I'm talking about Muslims now, not everybody. We Muslims accepted that contract. But when it comes to our needs, we ask Allah for the unlimited. When it comes to our obligation, we limit what we want to give back to Allah. So we limited our religion in few rakahs, few prayers we do. We said, you know, that's it. What else? I pray, and then those who are generous, they also fast. And they say, we also fast. Some Muslims don't fast, right? And those who make Hajj or Umrah, they say, yeah, we've done everything. But listen to the concept of Ibadah. The concept of Ibadah in Islam is the absolute, unconditional submission and obedience to Allah in whatever He orders, commands, or expects. Whether you like it or you don't like it. Whether you learn and know the wisdom behind it or you don't. Because if you only submit when your brain tells you it is good for you, then there's a lot that you will leave out. Because our brains do not understand everything that Allah knows. We only understand part of what He has already told us. So if we try to follow our limitations on Allah's expectations of us, we are actually depriving ourselves from His bounties and givings. In other words, from the beginning, Allah created us and He gave us the hearing, جَعَلَ لَكُمُ السَّمْعَ وَالْأَبْصَارِ Your sights, وَالْأَفْئِدَةِ And your hearts. Now, why are those coming in that order? It is because this is how things evolve. When you're born, the first and the only thing working is not your eyes, it's your ears. You could hear, but you couldn't see. In one week or 10 days, your eyes will start to work. But for your heart to start reasoning and reflecting and understanding and reacting, with love and hate and everything else, it takes a longer time. But the eyes and the ears are the venues and the windows that deliver things to the heart. So you see something, and if you decide that it is beautiful, nice, and pleasant, you communicate this message in your heart. So your heart remembers. It's stamped there that green and water are nice sceneries. Right? And when you see something awful or bad or evil, then your ears or your eyes will communicate this to your heart. So the heart is the receptacle, but the ears and the eyes are the windows through which you receive. These are what we call the basic senses. The basic senses are as-sam' wal-basar. But then there are other senses, your taste, your touch, your hand, and then your heart. So you have to be careful. What you feed your heart influences how you think. Because we think based on what we love or hate. 
If you love something, you're attracted to it. If you hate something, it turns you off, it turns you away. So when you watch things that are evil, what are you feeding your heart is evil. Wrongdoing, injustice, bad things, bad ideas. When you hear things that are not acceptable to Allah, you are feeding your heart with the same. Then when you want to do something good, the heart will find it difficult because it's polluted. It's too polluted, too dirty to deal with what is pure. So you come then after watching a movie for three hours and you want to read the Quran and then the shaitan tells you the fact. The fact is you don't understand because your heart is not ready to interact with this pure material. Your heart is not open to receive it. Your heart either has a seal or has some dents or has some pollutants that confuse it. When you open your eyes to the Quran, you don't see the beauty of it. When you look at your wife or husband, you don't see them as satisfactory or pleasant. But when you look at others, you see their beauty, you see they're attractive, they are good because your heart spent a lot of time with your eyes and ears looking at what is not yours. So when it comes to seeing what is beautiful in what Allah has given you, you don't see its beauty. So there are reasons that we end up creating problems for ourselves because we look outside and we compare and we find what we have much less. As the American cliche says, the grass is always greener on the other side. Nobody smells his own smell, no matter how awful it may be, even or how beautiful it may be, you don't smell yourself. But your surrounding do smell. You may not notice your bad habits or bad attitudes, but people who live around you, they know it. It's like your smell. So we have to be careful that we only consume what is good and pure. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna sama, certainly your hearing, wal basara, and your eyes, your eyesight, wal fuad, and your heart, kullu ulaika kana anhu mas'ula. You are going to be answerable for your hearing, your sight, and your heart. What are you using them for? You know that there are so many tools that we humans make because we need them in our life. We need knives to use them for cooking and for other things. We need screwdrivers to help us deal with other, you know, toolkits and stuff like this. But how is it that a human being will use the knife to kill his neighbor or his son or his father? It's so convoluted to understand, but no, it is not. When the person is constantly fed with hatred, animosity, ill feeling, and evil ideas, one day, one time, he will use a tool that was given for what is right to do what is evil and what's wrong. So the knife is a double-edged sword, and everything Allah gave us is a double-edged sword, including the basics, our hearing, our sight, and our hearts. And those are the three most influential tools that Allah has given us. Number one, to survive, to live. You know, if somebody is uh, missing one eye or missing one ear, we think they are handicapped, right? Is half blind or uh, half deaf. But in reality, we turn ourselves completely deaf, completely blind by not using these tools for what is lawful and what is uh, legal and what's acceptable to Allah. So in the hadith, in the another hadith, the Prophet sallallahu talks to Mu'az to guide him about the basics of deen and how to relate to Allah. So he tells him about salah, he tells him about jihad, that they are important elements of our life as Muslims. And then he concludes everything by saying, Ala adulluka ala milaki dhalika kulli. Shouldn't I tell you about 
the basic, the summary, the conclusion. He says, what? The Prophet ﷺ says, أمسك عليك لسانك. He holds his tongue out and he holds it with his hand and says, أمسك عليك لسانك. Hold on to your tongue. Do not speak ill. Do not backbite. Do not slander. Do not injure or hurt anybody with your tongue. So Mu'adh was surprised. He says, Oh Prophet Muhammad, are we actually going to be accountable for what we utter with our own tongue? The Prophet ﷺ says, فَكَلَتْكَ أُمُّكَ يَا مُعَاذ May, Maybe your mother would miss you, which means you are put to death and she will cry over you. وَهَلْ يَكُبُّ النَّاسِ عَلَى وُجُوهِهِمْ فِي النَّارِ أو على مناخرهم في النار إلا حصائد ألسنتهم Is there anything that condemns people more to hellfire than the result and the outcome of what they say with their tongue? So another weapon and another tool that Allah gave us to use it for dhikr, for enjoying the good, for bidding the evil, for guidance, to guide people and to guide our own families, our own selves to what is right and what is acceptable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then we turn against ourselves. And instead of admonishing people and using our tongue to do what is right, we injure people. We say what hurts. And unfortunately, most of the time, we do it intentionally. But then later on, we justify it and say, because we were angry. As if anger is a license to hurt. Anger is not. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you the ability for self-control and self-discipline. If you do not exercise it, you lose it. So if someone grows up with tantrums all his life, from childhood to youthhood to manhood, and then he becomes a mature, grown-up, responsible person, but then he has no responsibility when he or she becomes angry. Why? Because they have grown up giving themselves the license. When angry, I can do anything. Throwing a tantrum like a man is not a good thing. It's not good even as a child, but at least it's not good when you are a full grown-up youthful person or a man and then you still give yourself the license to hurt with your tongue when you are angry. That is not a license. The Prophet ﷺ says, لَيْسَ الْقَوِيُّ بِالصُّرْعَةِ A strong person is not a person who is good at wrestling, arm twisting and leg twisting and breaking somebody's bone. وَلَكِنَّ الْقَوِيُّ مَنْ يُمْسِكُ نَفْسَهُ عِنْدَ الْغَضَبِ A strong person indeed is one who is strong in self-control, especially when he's angry. Of course, the language is he, but it applies to he and she. So, when we come and relate to Allah, treating the gifts he gave us, the, ear, the ears, the, the, the hearing, the sight, and the heart, and the tongue, and the hands, we have to be careful. Because these tools can easily be taken away. They can easily, very easily, they can be taken away. So if we take it for granted, and then add it to this, which is wrong to take it for granted, and then add it to this on top of that, we abuse it instead of use it. Then we are asking Allah to take it away. Now, because it became more hurtful than helpful, both to yourself and to those around you. And that applies not only to these tools and gifts, but to everything else. Your money can be used or abused. Your health can be used or abused. Everything that Allah gives you, it can be used or abused. And when you abuse it consistently, you're asking Allah, if Allah loves you, He will take it away from you because you are using it to hurt yourself. It is exactly, just for example, not for comparison, 
when you see your child, you gave him a toy, but then instead of playing with it, he is sticking it in the electric outlet. So you see that this is not good for him, you take it away from him, right? So before Allah takes away his gifts and blessings from us, we have to ask ourselves this very basic question. Are we honest and trustworthy to be entrusted with these gifts? And are we using it properly? Our tongues, our ears, and our eyes, and our hearts. In our life today, we use those for everything else but what pleases Allah the most and what benefits us the most. We use our ears for music and for movie and for other things, but very little. And when it comes to the Quran, we have little or no time. Look at this. Allah gave you your ears so that when he talks to you, you hear him. When he sends you a message, you read it. And he gave you the heart so that when you read it, you reflect, you understand. أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ أَمْ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبٍ أَقْفَالُهَا Don't they ponder and reflect on the Qur'an or else are there locks and seals on their hearts? So the purpose of Allah giving us our heart is to understand. But when we use it for everything else that is based on whims and desires, what we call in the colloquial language, المزاج. المزاج. This is what I want. This is what I feel like doing. When we give ourselves those attitudes and keep nurturing them and our surrounding keep telling us, do what you want, they are condemning us, they are not helping us. And that's why the Arab say, لَيْسَ الصَّدِيقُ مَنْ صَدَّقَكْ وَلَكِنَّ الصَّدِيقَ مَنْ صَدَّقَكْ A friend is not one who acquiesces what you want and play cat what you express. It is one who advises you as needed even though when you don't like it. One who is truthful in his relationship. But unfortunately, some of us do not like advices. Prophet Saleh was talking to his people back and forth, right and left, and at the end they reject him and they do exactly the opposite. So he said, after they are gone with the punishment and everything, he says, how, what, what could I have done when I am advising you, but you don't like those who advise you? وَلَكِنْ لَا تُحِبُّونَ النَّاصِحِينَ So one of the basic, most fundamental quality of a believer in relating to Allah is to accept Allah's admonishment no matter how it comes to you. Sometimes Allah sends one of your enemies to correct your behavior. Sometimes you hear advices that are good from people that you think they are your enemies. But Allah sent them for you. But unfortunately, hating advice is a quality for either hypocrites or disbelievers. To find this quality in a Muslim is beyond anybody's explanation. I cannot perceive or understand why would a Muslim hate a person who is advising him. It is like going to the doctor with the intention to do the opposite of what he's telling you. Why do we submit to the doctor? He says three times a day, we don't take it six times a day. He says one time a day, we don't take it two times a day. Why do we submit to the doctor? It's because we trust his knowledge, and we trust his honesty, and we trust that he has done good enough research that he has the experience to deal with our condition. Now, not for comparison again, but just to illustrate how much trust do we exhibit when it comes to Allah's advice and to the guidance of the Prophet ﷺ. They tell us, go right, we go left. They tell us, okay, go left, then we go right. Why? Either, أَفِي قُلُوبِهِمْ شَكٌ أَمْ اِرْتَابُوا أَمْ يَخَافُونَ أَنْ يَحِيفَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِمْ وَرَسُولُهُ Those hypocrites who reject 
Allah's commands and the orders of his Prophet, the Quran asks and raises fundamental questions. Do they have doubt in their heart? Or don't they trust the goodness of what is delivered to them? Or are they afraid that Allah or his messenger would do injustice to them? How? How could we not be happy to receive Allah's guidance and implement it right away? But then above that, we disobey Allah and we ask Allah to forgive us. Some of us think that is normal. That is what the Quran says. That Allah will accept the repentance of people who make something bad and then they repent. That is true. But if we keep repeating one and the same thing, what happens? Well, the Prophet ﷺ says, Inna Allah, la yamal hatta tamallu. Allah will never get bored forgiving you until you are bored to ask him. But then how is it that some of us, not only we do not ask Allah to accept our repentance or forgive our sins, but we don't even care to sort what we're doing if it is sinful or not. We just do it. And definitely, if you do not think of what you're doing, to put it in the right box, if it is righteous, then it is righteous. You say, Alhamdulillah, that has enabled me to do ABC. And if it is not, then you say, Astaghfirullah, that I did ABC. But when we live without thinking, because we are thinking about other things, we are too busy to interact with Allah, both through our actions, and our assessment and our evaluation that we end up taking Allah for granted. That you are so secure. Allah is going to forgive me. Don't worry about it. And some of us say, faith is only in the heart. I don't have to pray. I don't have to do this. No, 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 no. That's too much extreme. That's too heavy of a commitment. I don't know how you guys do it. And they think that they are going to be forgiven. Amazing. So we misread the guidance of Allah and we live by misguidance after Allah has guided us. Allah guides us and then we leave his guidance, do the opposite and we think that part of his guidance is still good. But the Prophet ﷺ says, خُذُوهُ كُلَّهُ أَوْ تُرُكُوهُ كُلَّهُ Take this faith, take this religion as a whole, or leave it as a whole. Don't stand in the middle. Take Allah seriously, or don't claim that you believe in Him. Otherwise, you have to deliver on your claim. So there is the claim of faith, and there is actual faith. What is the difference? It's practice. It is the way we think, the way we practice. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to practice our faith, and to live it faithfully and completely. Alhamdulillah wa kafa wa salat wa salam ala ibadihi alladhina astafa wa ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah wahdahu la sharika lah wa ashadu anna sayyidna wa lana muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluhu wa ba'd In another narration of the hadith we mentioned earlier is حق الله على العبيد أن يعبدوه ولا يشركوا به شيئا أن يشكر ولا يكفر أن يذكر ولا ينسى that you worship Allah and associate none with him that we exhibit full gratitude and thanks to Allah full praise full glorification to Allah and the third is that you remember him but what is key is and never forget him. The minute we forget Allah, the minute we expose ourselves to the shaitan. The shaitan only can influence us at the minute or the second we forget Allah. And that's why in the Quran, Allah says, Nasu Allah They neglected Allah and Allah neglected them. This is not nasi to forget, but to ignore. So if we ignore Allah, 
Allah will ignore us. This is very mutual relationship. So if you think yourself as a purchased, paid off servant, and you think of Allah as your master, the one who paid you for working and living for him, then you have to do your job. What is your job? To worship Allah and never to associate any partner with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As we mentioned before, not only our windows into our heart, for which we have responsibility, we have responsibilities for every gift Allah gave us. On that day, you will certainly be asked about all the bounties Allah has given you. Everything from material bounties to moral bounties to guidance to intellect, everything Allah will ask you about. So we have to be ready. And to be ready to answer Allah, we have to exercise constant self-questioning. Second, guess yourself before you act. What if? What if I die as I am doing this? The more frequent we ask this question, the more alert and cognizant of the presence of Allah we become. But the less we ask ourselves those questions, the less connected with Allah we become. And that will make the difference between a person who has good manners with Allah, feeling His presence, feeling that He's watching over you, feeling that you're accountable to Him, feeling that all what you use of any and everything is not more than a gift of His that He entrusted you with. So money is Allah's money. Health is Allah's gift. Then why Allah says, Amwalakum, your money? It is just to boost your morale and give you the sense of ownership. But in reality, all what Allah gives us, وَمَا بِكُمْ مِن نِعْمَةٍ فَمِنْ اللَّهِ Allah is the one who gives. So when He gives something, and He gives you the instruction how to use it, then He is not giving you for absolute ownership, but for a trust. Everything we get is a trust. لِيَنْظُرَ كَيْفَ تَعْمَلُونَ Allah gives us to see how we are going to exercise responsibility with what He gave us. I have been told right before coming here that the American Muslims for Palestine, which is an organization that is dedicated to the development of uh, Palestinian issues and educating the public about it. And recently they embarked on something very, very useful. They have embarked on curriculum development of materials that can be ready for the public education, which is needed. We know that people have a lot of misinformation about Palestine, its history, the suffering of its people, the situation on the grounds. So they dedicated a project fully for this. The project will cost about $100,000 to dedicate at least a couple of people or three people to work for a year or two to just come up with this kind of curriculum. Researchers who will put together materials that are good for children, materials that are good for public library, materials that are good for civic institutions. And that requires a lot of money. And today we are asking your generosity to support them. They are asking Dar al-Hijra to come up with $10,000. I hope that one person can do it or two and save all of us the hustle. And I believe it is worthwhile cause and I believe it is money well spent because it's money that goes into inoculation. You know what inoculation is? <coughs> Immunization. Immunizing the people against false information. So before they become your enemy, give them the right information, they may become your friends. This is the strategy that works to give some relief 
for our people in Palestine. This country is the country that is most misinformed about this Palestinian brothers and sisters issues and we ought to stand with them. They are asking all of us to participate in this. So if we just get $100 from 100 people, we get the $10,000 in a few minutes. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it clear in our heart that what we have is His and what we spend goes to Him and to purify our intention to make everything for His pleasure. Allahumma ameen. Allahumma hadina fi man hadayt. Wa'afina fi man afayt. Wa tawallana fi man tawallayt. Waqina wasrif anna sharra ma qadayt. Allahumma qsim lana min khashyatika ma tahulu bi baynana wa bayna ma'asiyatik. Wa min ta'atika ma tuballighuna bihi jannatak. Wa min al yaqeen ma tuhawunu bi alayna masaib al dunya. Wa matti'na Allahumma bi asma'ina wa absarina wa quwatina ma ahyaytana. واجعله الوارث منا واجعل ثأرنا على من ظلمنا ولا تجعل مصيبتنا في ديننا ولا تجعل الدنيا أكبر همنا ولا مبلغ علمنا ولا إلى النار مصيرنا وإذا أردت بقومنا فتنة فنجنا منها يا مولانا غير خزايا ولا مفتونين ولا مبدلين ولا مغيرين اللهم لا تدع لنا في يومنا هذا ذنبا إلا غفرته ولا دينا إلا قضيته ولا هما إلا فرجته ولا كربا إلا نفسته ولا سائلا إلا أعطيته ولا مسافرا إلا رددته ولا أسيرا إلا فككته ولا مظلوما إلا نصرته ولا تدع ظالما لمسلم إلا قسمته اللهم عليك بالظالمين الجبارين المتكبرين فإنهم لا يعجزونك اللهم انتصر لإخواننا في سوريا اللهم انتصر لإخواننا في كل مكان اللهم انتصر لإخواننا في فلسطين وفي العراق وفي باكستان وفي أفغانستان وفي كل بلاد الإسلام يا رب العالمين اللهم انصر الإسلام وأعز المسلمين وأعلي بفضلك يا رب كلمة الحق والدين اللهم انتصر للمظلومين وانتصر للمستضعفين اللهم قوي عبادك المستضعفين اللهم قوي عبادك المستضعفين اللهم ثبت أقدامهم واربط على قلوبهم ووحد كلمتهم واجمع شملهم ووحد صفهم وسدد رميتهم واخذل عدوهم فإنه لا يعجزك يا رب العالمين أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم فستذكرون ما أقول لكم وأفوض أمري إلى الله إن الله بصير بالعباد وأقم الصلاة الله أكبر